In 1880, a 43-year-old woman that was identified as Mademoiselle X went to French psychiatrist and neurologist Jules Cotard because she was suffering with anxiety, feelings of despair, and she believed that she was dead. She told the doctor that she no longer had a brain, nerves, a chest, a stomach, or intestines, and that she was nothing more than a decomposing body. She also believed, however, that she couldn't die a natural death because she'd been cursed to eternal damnation. She said that she would live forever unless she was set on fire. Unfortunately, Mademoiselle X stopped eating and she died of starvation before treatment could begin. Dr. Qatar called her affliction the delirium of negation because the person denies their very own existence. He began documenting the illness, and it became known as Qatar delusion or walking corpse syndrome. Walking corpse syndrome, the nihilistic delusion or Qatar syndrome, is extremely rare with around 200 cases worldwide. It's considered a symptom of a pre-existing condition, and it's when the person believes they don't exist or are dead or dying. They may believe their skin is putrefying, their blood has dried up, their internal organs are gone or their skin is rotten. Some may even pick at their skin to try and remove what they see as dead skin. People with catards often lose the desire to sleep, to talk, to bathe, to eat, because what's the point? They believe they're dead. It tends to be seen in patients with psychosis, clinical depression, brain tumors, brain injury, epilepsy, and Parkinson's. It's also been seen in some patients with lycanthropy and cluster headaches, which are two other conditions that I'll be talking about. Cotards may be treated with psychotherapy, electroconvulsive therapy, antipsychotics, or antidepressants. Clinical lycanthropy, or lycomania, is a symptom in which a person believes they can transform into, have already transformed into, or is a non-human animal. Some may look in the mirror and instead of seeing their reflection, they see a werewolf or another animal instead. They may walk on all fours, they may howl or growl, they may use their fingers like claws, they may live in the woods, or in very extreme cases. The delusions may cause the person to actually attempt to eat human flesh. A case report on clinical lycanthropy, first published in 1859, described a man that was admitted to an asylum in France. He was convinced that he had transformed into a wolf. In the report, it said that the man parted his lips with his fingers, and he said he had cloven feet and that his body was covered in long hair. He also craved raw meat, but when it was given to him, he wouldn't eat it because it wasn't rotten enough. Now fast forward to 2016 in the Austin Harriff case, where at one point during the trial, a psychiatrist that was hired by his defense team believed Austin suffered from clinical lycanthropy. If you don't recognize the name Austin Harriff, you'll probably recognize the story. He became known as the Florida Cannibal. On August 15th in 2016 in Jupiter, Florida, John Stevens and his wife Michelle were relaxing in their garage when they were randomly attacked by 19-year-old Austin Harriff. A neighbor tried to help, but he was also attacked. When police arrived, Austin was on top of John in a bear hug, and he continued to bite off chunks of John's face and at his abdomen. And this was even after he was tased, kicked in the head multiple times, and even after cops threatened to shoot him. He had superhuman strength. Deputies also saw flesh in his front teeth. There are even pictures of it. Inside the garage, they found his wife, Michelle, and she was also dead. Austin had stabbed the couple as well. He was taken to the hospital where he said that he had eaten something bad. When asked what he had eaten, he said, human. It was rumored during the time that he had taken bath salts or flaca, but only alcohol and trace amounts of marijuana were found in the toxicology report. During the trial, text messages that Austin had sent to his friends were read, and they mentioned almost daily drug use and him becoming blackout drunk from alcohol. Now, clinical lycanthropy is usually brought on by a psychotic episode that's caused by schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or a depressive disorder. 
The average age of onset for schizophrenia tends to be in the late teens to the early 20s for men. Austin was 19 at the time, and his, and his father said that schizophrenia runs in their family. In November of this year, 2022, he was found not guilty by reason of insanity, and he's now in a mental hospital. The first known case of fatal familial insomnia, or FFI, can be traced to a doctor in Venice, Italy in the 18th century. FFI is a prion disease that is caused by a malfunction of proteins in the brain. And according to rarediseases.org, when a mutation of a gene occurs, the protein products may be faulty, inefficient, absent, or overproduced. Shortly after the doctor's death, FFI took his nephew, Giuseppe, his sons, Angelo and Vincenzo, their children and their great-grandchildren. It's been like a curse to the family. In 1984, when Silvano, also a relative of the doctors, started showing signs of the disease, he began to sweat profusely with pinpoint pupils, and he decided that it was time for his family to stop suffering in silence. His father also had FFI, and he died during World War II. Sadly, Savano knew what was to come. He said that I'll stop sleeping and within eight or nine months I'll be dead. He checked into a sleep clinic in Bologna, Italy, and he was dead four months later. His condition targeted parts of the thalamus at the center of the brain. The thalamus is the part of the brain that regulates sleep. It's normally the size and shape of a walnut, but the thalamus in Savano's brain looked like a sponge. FFI tends to start between the ages of 35 and 61, and it kills the person between 13 to 36 months later. How long have you been here? <coughs> hmm? Yeah. How much? Two weeks. Okay. Yes. Sometimes Cork appeared to be dozing, but EEG measurements of the electrical activity in his brain showed nothing that could be classified as sleep. Because it starts in middle age, family members can pass it on before they know that they even have the gene mutation. They have a 50-50 chance of inheriting it. In rare instances, FFI occurs without a family history of the disease. Those that have it in their family sometimes opt out of knowing if they have the gene because it's always over their head. If it's my story, I get to choose whether I laugh or cry about it. It's my choice. I'm going to laugh about it. It's my day. It's my life. Carolyn and Cheryl are sisters who have lived for years with a mortal secret. Like a poison fruit, a genetic mutation hangs on the family tree. It killed their grandfather, their uncle, and in 1999 revealed itself in their mom, Barbara. I can remember saying, Mom, what's wrong? Why can't you speak? She couldn't speak because she could not sleep at all. Inside Barbara's brain, a genetic tripwire had been crossed, and in a matter of months, she went from being a vigorous 52-year-old woman to a coma, emerging only a few days at the very end. They took her intubation out, and she couldn't really talk because she was so dry-throated and everything, and she was trying to write, and she wrote FFI with a question mark behind it, and I said, that's what they think it is. And she just kind of went. <laughs> she never wanted to think it. She never wanted to will it to happen. The symptoms start off mild, but they progress rapidly. Insomnia begins early in the disease and it gets progressively worse until the person can no longer sleep. Many of the symptoms that happen after insomnia begin are caused because the person just is unable to sleep. Sleep aids don't help with FFI and it may put the person in a coma, but they still aren't able to sleep. Because the person is unable to get that much needed rejuvenated deep sleep, it leads to rapid mental and physical deterioration. It's like being awake for the last six months of your life. If you know what it feels like going 24 hours without sleep, imagine an entire week and then an entire month, then two months without sleep, then three months, without sleep. There is currently no cure for FFI, and only in death can they finally get rest. 
pressure has been building for about almost 10 minutes and the spiking pain is starting to kick in every now and again eventually the pain is going to build to a constant pain and the little spiking pain that feels like a hot poker <clears throat> is going to intensify and get worse and more frequent It is getting bad. It always starts behind my eye. It starts out as an itch and then the pressure builds. <laughs> and then it gets worse from there. <clears throat> Suicide headaches or cluster headaches are described as one of the most painful conditions humans are capable of experiencing. Women who experience cluster headaches say the pain can be worse than childbirth. Soldiers who've lost limbs would rather step on another landmine than have another episode. Here are some of the ways the pain has been described. Like a brain freeze when you eat something cold but multiply that by 100. Like a railroad spike is being driven into your temple. Like someone jabbed a white hot poker into your eye socket and is holding it there for 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Like you were just shot in the face. Like a paper cut in your eye in the center of your head. A pain that is so sharp and excruciating there's no talking or doing anything other than just screaming to try to get out of it. It makes you want to get up and literally run from the pain. Some people try to knock themselves out until the pain passes. Even though they're called headaches, clusters are not like migraines. The pain of a cluster headache is typically one-sided and it's concentrated around the eye and the temple but can sometimes spread to other areas. On the affected side, the eye will tear up and it may droop and the nose may also get congested. Each headache tends to last 30 to 45 minutes though some are shorter and some are longer. The person may experience up to eight of these headaches within 24 hours, and this may happen for weeks or several months at a time. Then the clusters may temporarily stop for reasons that aren't yet understood. In 1747, a physician described a patient who was suffering from cluster headaches. He said, a healthy, robust man of middle age was each day at the same hour troubled by pain above the orbit of the left eye where the nerve leaves through the bony frontal opening. After a short time, the left eye began to redden and tears to flow. Then he felt as if his eye was protruding from its orbit with so much pain that he became mad. After a few hours, all this evil ceased and nothing in the eye appeared at all changed. Scientists don't know exactly what causes cluster headaches, but they believe it involves the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is the part of our brain that's responsible for a circadian rhythm, which is our body's sleep weight pattern over the course of a 24-hour day. Most headache doctors have had patients with cluster headaches who have taken their life because of the pain. They know that they're going to get one or two or three of these headaches every day forever, and that is a very hard thing to live with. The only treatment known to be effective is LSD and psychedelic mushrooms. The person isn't given enough to hallucinate. It's a very small dose. Margellan's disease is a rare skin condition where fibers appear underneath the skin or emerge from slow healing sores. A large portion of the medical community believe that those suffering from Morgellons are delusional. It's often misdiagnosed as delusional parasitosis or obsessive picking disorder. People that are affected by it may see things crawling beneath their skin and some see bugs coming out of their body. They start to scratch their skin in order to remove the fibers and this causes the sores. They may even feel things crawling, biting, or stinging. And some people believe that it's caused by chemtrails. Many Morgellons patients develop the disease after coming into contact with soil during gardening. And dogs and cats have also been diagnosed with Morgellons. Some of the symptoms are spontaneously erupting skin lesions, fibers and granules beneath and or extruding from the skin, fatigue and short-term memory loss. The fibers don't usually match any known fibers. 
calcium and other minerals have also been found in some of the fibers. A lot of the fibers are hard and feel like splinters. It's unknown whether Morgellons is a distinct disease or a bizarre manifestation of Lyme disease. Almost all Morgellons patients have Lyme disease, but most people with Lyme disease do not have Morgellons. This disease has been reported on every continent except Antarctica, and it tends to affect mostly women. Body integrity disorder is a neurological disorder where the person has the overwhelming desire to amputate or damage healthy parts of their body. Because most doctors won't cut off healthy arms or legs, the person may attempt to amputate or damage the limb so badly that amputation is necessary. It's believed to be caused by damage to the right parietal lobe of the brain, and of those who have had a limb removed by a doctor, most are happy with their decision after the fact. I'll end on a lighter note with Paris Syndrome. Paris Syndrome mainly affects Japanese tourists who are visiting Paris for the first time. About 6 million Japanese tourists visit Paris every year, but a few dozen experience overwhelming anxiety, hallucinations, delusions, and feelings of persecution because of their trip. Because most people who experience Paris Syndrome do not have a history of mental illness, the leading thought is that it's caused by the disparity between the Paris that is shown in Japanese media and the real Paris. There's even a 24-hour helpline that's run by the Japanese Embassy in Paris to help these tourists. <laughs>